course, another tutorial that's in the specular reflection section. And I want to do some things to our um, shader before we start writing a cook torrent, uh, start putting it in the cook torrent section. So there are a few things we need to do to prepare the shader. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, look at all of the properties which were arranged and not a box. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this and see that this bump depth has a uh, it, it is a range, meaning that it's a slider, and then we're going to copy the name, paste it here, um, put in some um, parentheses, quotation marks, and then we're going to do um, comma, float, close the parentheses, and it's equal to the same value as up here. And then we're going to do this to shininess. We are basically going to add a range since the shininess was a um, floating point box. So we're going to add a range to it and we're going to change the name from shininess to roughness, which will make more sense when we have a cook, when we're using it, when we convert this to a cook torn shader. And make sure that you put the name where the slider is and not where the floating point box is. We're also going to do that for the event cap range. We're going to do it for global illumination and we're going to do it for wrap. So take a quick look at this section. I'm going to pull, I'm going to allow you to pause the video in a second. Um, when it comes to rim power, you're going to change this name to F0, but you're not going to do anything to the rim power. You're not going to add a uh, floating point box for it. So let me zoom in so you can see what's going on. So pause the video and write this down. Okay, I'm assuming that you, you're done pausing with that. So now we're going to come down here to the fragment shader and we're going to add in the half vector. So we're going to do half three, half vector equals normalize I light direction X, Y, Z comma I view direction. Close the parenthesis and add the semicolon. And then we're going to do, uh, actually, I want to move this half vector up here to this section because it's, um, it's not a dot product. It's, a uh, if we're taking, um, the right direction vector and the view direction director vector and dividing it by two to find a half vector. And make sure you leave at least one space between N dot uh, L and the rest of this stuff. So we're going to now do half N dot H, which is going to be saturated dot normal direction half vector. Then we're going to do half N dot V saturate dot normal direction view direction. Then we're going to do a half V dot H saturate dot I, I view direction half vector then we're going to do half h dot l saturate dot half vector i light direction then we're going to do half v dot l is going to be equal to equal to saturate dot I the 
you. Yeah, Rich D. Cannot type and talk at the same time. View direction, and it's going to be a light direction, so it's I. Dot. I light direction dot X, Y, Z. Okay, so depending on which micro facet distribution function and which geometric attenuation function we use, we may have to um, use these um, different dot products down here. If we don't end up using them for a particular lighting model, we'll just delete it. So that's the first thing that, so that's the second thing that we're going to do to this function. The third thing that we're going to do to this function is we're going to take a look at um, what's going on with our um, our diffuse texture and we want to make sure that we are multiplying by the diffuse texture A at least in one part of our lighting model and this is for if, if this is for um, or if, in case you decide to put a specular map in the alpha um, alpha channel of your diffuse texture so you want to make sure that there's at least a text.a down here somewhere um, so that's all we need to do to um, our base lighting our, that's all we need to do to our base shader so now we're going to rename this UC for unity cookie CT for cook torrent so we're going to call it base lowercase b and we're going to save it as um, edit UC edit 3 and then we're going to save one that's going to be uh, Beckman for we're going to, to be actually making three separate versions of the shader one's going to be Beckman one's going to be GGX and one's going to still be Bill and Fong So one for one is going to be back and we're going to save this as U C edit B. And then we're going to do one is GGX. We're going to do file. Save as edit G. And then we're going to do one that's going to be PB for uh well for falling billing and we're gonna hit save okay so now that we've done that um i'm going to now explain why we want to keep one for um why we want to still continue to have one B Bill and Fong. So, if you watched my last video, and I'm hoping that you did, there was a portion in the Cook Torts um, the tutorial where I was saying how Bill and Fong have their own geometric attenu uh, attenuation, um, as well as them also being a lighting model. So you're probably wondering why you couldn't just stick a Bill and Fong lighting uh, function inside of a Cook Torrent shader if you uh, remove the geometric attenuation and remove the um, uh, micro facet distribution function. Technically, you can do it. It's not really a Cook Torrent shader anymore. What you would be doing is you would be keeping the Fresnel Fresnel um, portion of the cook torrent shader but you would be pretty much removing everything else and that is something that we will be doing for our, our, our Bill and Fong shader and the reason for, uh, for doing this is because you may be wanting to model a more complicated um, 
light, um, you may want to model a more t complicated type of lighting that would be too computationally heavy to do with a regular cook torn shader or you may not know how to do it with a cook torn shader um, and there are a couple different situations where you may want to do that one of the situations would be for if you're going to do dual specular so you're going to have a specular highlight on top of another specular highlight and the other situation would be if you're working with um, odd types of reflectance so when it comes to cloth sometimes cloth has some unusual reflectance properties so in this case we're looking at velvet and satin and so in both of these uh, pictures we have lighting either coming from the front or lighting coming from the side or no um, lighting is coming from the side here and lighting is coming from the front here and so what's going on for satin is when you shine the light to the side uh, we get uh, the highlight um, at the 90, at 90 degrees away from the direction that you shine the light at and when you shine the light directly we kind of have a uh, not so um, bright highlight and we don't really have too much shadowing around the sides I honestly think that um, satin could probably be modeled pretty well with an Oranair diffused lighting and then um, you might have to do some hacks to try and get the uh, specular get a specular function to behave this way um, when it comes to velvet velvet is kind of a uh, retro reflective and so what's going on is well actually no this one this isn't retro reflective what's going on is um, you shine a light at velvet and the highlight is not uh, where you're shining the light at but it's actually on the sides and for a velvet lighting model um, you wanna you don't necessarily want to use a cook torn shader for this you could use um, bow and fong and then the other um, the situation is retro reflectance lighting so let retro reflective lighting basically works like this so you have a surface and then you have your surface normal which is um, perpendicular to your surface and then like let's say you have a light coming from a flashlight that's shining um, on the surface and it is going to have a reflection and you may decide that you want to see the reflection so you're going to try and put your camera um, at the same angle as the incoming light but reflect it um, ref uh, mirrored over the normal vector which would, would place it um, 90 degrees uh, away from the light source so this is uh, the normal in this case is at 90 90 degrees because the surface is facing directly up so we're reflecting the angle of the light um, over uh, the 90 degrees which is where the normal is at and you would expect to see the reflection over here but for a retro reflective surface the reflection won't appear there the reflection will actually appear um, in the same uh, at the same angle of the light on the same side of the normal so instead of it being in this on uh, on this side it'll be on this side so if this was a 
this surface was actually a very large oval or something. And this is what we're actually looking at. You would have, you, you would be normally trying to look over here somewhere when the light source is coming from this uh, side of the model. But the light source and the reflection are actually both over here on this side of the model. So if you move your view direction over here somewhere very close to the light source, you'll be able to see the reflection. But you will not see a reflection over here where you would normally expect to see the reflection with normal types of materials. Um, a good example of this would be um, like uh, stop signs, dividers on your um, road dividers, the yellow lines or in the white lines. Um, you'll also see it on semi rigs. Um, railroad crossings. It can be the plastic that's used in some uh, on uh, cars headlights and you see it on bicycles for the bicycle reflectors. And also I have another example um, but I need to pause the video to go get it because I uh, deleted the image. I wanted to spare you uh, the image of me rummaging through my files trying to find this. But anyway, so this is a bicycle I had. It got stolen, but um, back when I had it, it was a bicycle that had retroreflective tape put on it. And so the camera and the light source are basically um, at the same angle. And so I'm holding a flashlight actually pretty close to the camera. And the light is... Uh, illuminating the retroreflective tape and so the brightness, the highlight of the uh, retroreflective uh, tape is shining directly at the camera because the again the light source and uh, the reflective angle is basically the same angle. Of course if the surface is a little bit rough I'll look a little bit more diffused and I don't necessarily have to have my camera exactly where the light source is in order to be able to see the reflection but this is a, an example of a retro reflective material. Also, so are the um, reflectors uh, around on the um, the spokes, and there's also a reflector up here. Even though uh, most of the sur uh, the reflector is facing this way, but there's a little side angle over here, and you can kind of see the reflection here. So that's basically how. Um, retro-reflective surfaces behave and as you can see the full reflection is at the same angle as the light source um, compared to a reflection off of a metal surface where um, the light reflection is um, not quite as intense. So retro-reflective surfaces and I know you probably can't see this uh, but if this retroreflective surface was a little bit larger, you would actually see some shadowing. Uh, if it was covering this um, entire uh, bicycle tube, you would actually see some shadowing um, uh, kind of along the edges. But the shadowing would look a lot different than this. The shadowing would be very, very, very close to the edge. And you would, and the fall off would be uh, very drastic. Um, we will, I guess I can... Uh, turn the um, Bill and Fong version of this shader into a retro reflective shader, uh, or and we can do that as well as having a uh, dual ref reflective uh, shader, dual specular, because um, you can do quite a few different things with the Bill and Fong model. It's not necessarily physically accurate when it comes to uh, conservation of energy, but for retroreflective lighting, you probably won't care for dual specular 
uh, Dillo's Specular isn't uh, physically accurate anyway, so you probably won't care for that, care to do, to, to worry about that either.